Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Opportunity to Learn webinar series. And today's discussion is around keeping public education uh, public. Many of you all know that in a number of the series webinars that we have discussed, it's really general, generally on topics that are designed to increase the opportunity to learn for all students across the country. Today's discussion is no different. During Reconstruction in the 1860s and 70s, one of the first things Black policymakers put in place was universal, universal compulsory public education. Um, and it was provided to all students regardless of race or social economic status. Soon thereafter, the practice of taking public funds and channeling them into private educational systems has been used to increase segregation and used in many respects to um, weaken the public education system. What the practice has done is not, it has not improved the opportunity to learn for public school students. Where we know 90% of our, our young people are educated yesterday, today, and will likely be educated tomorrow. So this discussion is very important in ensuring that the next generation of young people are able to attend a strong public educational system. That's why I'm excited that we have two experts on the issues who have joined us today. Uh, the first is Bacardi ja Jackson, who is the Senior Supervising Attorney for Children's Rights for the State of Florida. She's so good at what she does. She has a second title, Managing Attorney of the Miami Office for the Southern Poverty Law Center. We also have Jessica Levin, who is the Senior Attorney for Education Law Center where her practice includes both litigation and direct representation to protect students' rights. They're going to lead us collectively through this discussion. Before I turn it over to Jessica, I would just ask that you type your questions and comments into the chat box, and we will answer audience Q&A at the 45 minute mark of this discussion. So let me turn it over to uh, Jessica to get us started. Thank you very much. And we want to thank the Schott Foundation for hosting us to give this webinar today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Jackson, for that intro and that important background information about our topic. Um, I am Jessica Levin from Education Law Center. Uh, and I am but also, also the, the director of our Public Funds Public Schools campaign, which is a collaboration of Education Law Center Southern Poverty Law Center, and we'll talk uh, much more about that new campaign later. Uh, but right now, I will turn it over to Bacardi to introduce what we're going to talk about today on our webinar. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, today's webinar is about keeping public funds in public schools and strategies to oppose voucher programs. First. Jessica will talk briefly about the history of private school vouchers and its relevance to advocates opposing vouchers today. Next, we'll delve into how private school vouchers work and in particular, the evolving privatization landscape, which is marked by new and evolving forms of vouchers. We'll touch on the research demonstrating myriad negative effects of vouchers and the deleterious impact of vouchers on students' legal rights. And finally, we'll talk about the PSPS campaign, which is using a multifaceted strategy to oppose voucher programs. This will include examples of litigation and policy advocacy to oppose vouchers, our efforts to complement and add to the work of other wonderful organizations already in this arena. And we'll conclude with how others can join us in protect it, protecting public funding for public education to ensure that all of our children can attend a thriving public school. And afterwards, we look forward to answering any questions and engaging in a discussion. Uh, we really want to hear from you about these important topics um, for all of you on the webinar. So next slide, please, and back to Jessica. Thanks, Bacardi. So we want to elaborate uh, a little bit on the history of vouchers um, that Dr. Jackson touched on at the beginning uh, because this history is so important to efforts to fight vouchers and privatization today. So over the last two decades, uh, particularly in the last several years, we've seen an increase in voucher proposals and enacted voucher programs across the country. 
but we think it's crucial to have a full picture of the history of vouchers, not just in the modern era of vouchers over the last few decades, um, but all the way back through the 20th century. Um, and this includes the proliferation of tuition vouchers for segregated private schools during the mid 20th century. So part of the efforts to resist the Brown versus Board of Education decisions from the US Supreme Court to desegregate public schools included these tuition grant voucher programs in many states. And the, these vouchers were meant to allow white families to pay for segregation academies, uh, which were private schools that would only admit white students um, and, and the white families could use the tuition grants for those. A resource, if you wanna read more about that part of the history of private school vouchers, um, is a 2017 report from the Center for American Progress called The Racist Origins of Private School Vouchers. And that report provides a lot more detail on the proliferation of these segregation academies in many Southern states and, and also their lasting segregative effects on the public and private school populations in those states. Going back even a little bit further um, to the 19th century, there have been town tuitioning programs in Maine and Vermont since the 19th century, where the state pays for pays private school tuition for students in districts that don't operate their own public schools. Often it's because those districts are too rural to operate their own system of public schools. And so the municipality will pay for private schools. And those are longstanding programs in a couple of states. But a 1955 paper by Milton Friedman called The Role of Government ed in Education is considered a major influence in the proliferation of the modern wave of voucher programs um, after the 19th century, after the segregation academies of the mid 20th century. Um, there began to be kind of the modern era of vouchers spurred by Milton Friedman's ideas and the ideas of others that government shouldn't necessarily be the entity that runs public schools and should instead provide money in the form of vouchers to families to choose a private or other school for their child. So the first modern voucher program started to come about uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and in Milwaukee, specifically in Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin enacted a voucher program specifically for the city of Milwaukee that started in 1990 for low income students there. Um, Florida was also another early adopter of voucher programs and, for example, had the first voucher program specifically for students with disabilities enacted in the early 2000s. The history of vouchers, as we mentioned, is highly relevant to current efforts to oppose privatization, um, for, for example, because of the segregative effects of those segregation academies carrying through to today in the populations of public and private schools. Um, and, the, and that 2017 Center for American Progress report also offers um, some more context on the lasting segregative effects of vouchers, as well as concerns that modern voucher programs increased segregation among students as well. Um, another study in, from 2017 by the Century Foundation concluded that on balance, voucher programs are more likely to increase school segregation than to promote integration or maintain the status quo. Um, and that study analyzed Louisiana's school voucher program and confirmed, I'm quoting, patterns noted in demographic studies of voucher users and private school attendants that black students typically used vouchers to leave public schools where their race was overrepresented, but white students tended to leave public schools where their race was underrepresented. And these segregation issues with vouchers aren't limited to racial segregation. For example, there are concerns about segregation of students with disabilities or students with the most severe disabilities by voucher programs that target that student population. Uh, and private schools also concentrate the highest need students in the public school sector, which then has even fewer resources and less funding to meet the needs of those students who are more costly to educate. So a lot of factors, there's a confluence of a lot of factors that go back through the history of the 20th and even 19th century, um, which are relevant to the efforts to oppose vouchers today. So next slide, please. Private school vouchers, as many who are participating in the webinar know, 
redirect public funds to private educational uses. And this significantly undermines the ability of public schools, many of which are already struggling with insufficient resources to fulfill their state constitutional mandate of educating all students. It causes these schools to have even fewer, more inadequate resources um, to provide that equitable educational opportunity. There are a lot of different permutations of vouchers, and we want to touch on some of the main types, some of the main groupings of voucher programs um, to demonstrate how they are frequently evolving. So first, we have traditional private school vouchers, uh, like the Milwaukee voucher program. And these pay for all or part of a student's private school tuition, um, directing money from the public treasury to pay the private school cost. States can impose student eligibility requirements or limits um, on voucher amounts or conditions on private schools receiving student vouchers. So there are a lot of different variations in the legislation state to state that enacts voucher programs, but traditional private school vouchers that pay private school tuition were the first sort of modern iteration of this type of privatization. Tax credit vouchers are another type of voucher program. And more than a third of states provide either individuals or corporations with up to a 100% dollar for dollar credit to send money that they would otherwise owe in taxes to private organizations. And these private organizations, which are sometimes called scholarship granting organizations or SGOs or a name like that, then fund private school vouchers to pay for K through 12 students private tuition. So the money that would have gone to taxes goes to a scholarship organization and is then given to a family in the form of a voucher. And this is one of the ways, one of the major ways that voucher programs evolved when, for example, they started to run into trouble in the courts with directing public money um, in the traditional funding mechanism courts started to strike those programs down and vouchers morphed into the tax credit, uh, the tax credit um, mechanism, but still public money flowing out to private schools. Education savings accounts are yet another permutation of voucher programs and of public funds going to private educational uses. They're generally a percentage of the amount provided by the state to each public school to public schools for each student, so the per pupil funding. Um, but instead of going to the public school, the money is deposited into a personal account that can be used to pay for a student's private school tuition, but also for a lot of other different types of private educational expenses. Again, this varies state to state, the exact uses that the money can um, that somebody can go to, but it might include expenses in addition to tuition, such as tutoring, online coursework, transportation, supplies, and in some ESA programs, even homeschooling. Finally, one other voucher permutation that we wanted to be sure to mention is um, the push at the federal and state level to expand the use of 529 savings accounts, which you might have heard of for college savings. Their use is now being expanded to K through 12 private educational uses. Um, and a couple of years ago in 2017, Congress passed a law that paved the way for allowing the use of 529 savings accounts for K through 12 education expenses. And now some states have are now allowing this, other states are considering proposals to allow this use of 529 accounts. And that's just yet another permutation of the way that um, funds are being directed creatively to private schools and private educational uses. Additionally, we wanna mention that voucher programs are often specific to certain student populations, for example, students with disabilities. And this is another way that private school vouchers um, evolve and expand. It's a longstanding strategy of voucher proponents to begin with a smaller program with limited el eligibility that focuses on empathetic groups of students, um, including by income or disability status, and then gradually expand toward a universal voucher system that drains more and more money from the public schools. So in the last few years, we see vouchers targeted to more and more different segments of the student population. One notable example are, are 
so-called bullying vouchers, vouchers that are directed to students who have experienced bullying in schools. And Florida adopted um, the first such program in the country, and Bacardi is going to tell us more about that in a few minutes. Um, voucher programs, so they frequently appear in new forms with different names or different funding mechanisms. One motivation um, for adapting them is that the term voucher has become unpopular. And so proponents of voucher, voucher type programs change the name to things like a scholarship program to try to avoid that negative connotation that people have started associating with the negative effects of vouchers. Another reason that vouchers permutate, as we mentioned, is that they face challenges in the courts. And so the courts may strike down one funding mechanism or one type of voucher as unconstitutional or otherwise violating the law, and then the vouchers permutate into another form. Um, finally, there are numerous proposals for new or expanded voucher programs at both the state and federal level each year. Um, and PFPS is tracking these proposals across the country. Um, and our website will soon have a public legislative tracking tool that you can use to see voucher proposals in your state or in other states and see what's going on. Um, some proposals never make it out of committee. Others are seriously considered in committee or on a flow uh, or in a floor vote um, and are pushed aggressively and a few pass. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit later about some of the conditions that allow this proliferation of privatization proposals at the federal and state levels. Finally, just a word before I turn it back to Bacardi on how these programs are defeated and some of the strategies that PFPS and others are using. Um, and one is vigorous informed advocacy. Um, including crucially at the grassroots level. And in the last couple of years, we've seen one example of that critical grassroots advocacy in Arizona, where grassroots advocates were successful in getting a um, voucher, in getting a referendum on an expansion of Arizona's voucher program and successfully halting the expansion of those vouchers and, and rolling back that expansion. Um, this in-depth discussion of the effects of vouchers on public schools is another crucial strategy. For example, discussion of the ways that vouchers negatively impact civil rights. Parents and other stakeholders often aren't provided with adequate information of these impacts. For example, a GAO report found that in 2016-17, 83% of students who were enrolled in voucher programs designed specifically for students with disabilities were in a program that provided either no information about changes in their rights under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or provided information that the US Department of Education confirmed was inaccurate about these losses of rights. Disseminating research on the negative effects of vouchers is also crucial. Um, it helps to inform legislators and others that vouchers are not increasing academic outcomes or making other improvements for students that are often promised by, by voucher proponents. And we'll talk a little bit more about that research later. Activism by teachers and other public school advocates is also key. Um, and we've seen teachers, unions, and others being very active proponents for public education funding and against drains on public education funding in recent years. For example, in West Virginia this year. Uh, and finally, coalitions, uh, including unlikely allies. Many communities don't have private schools like some rural communities, and therefore unlikely allies can cross geographic and political divides in those areas to oppose voucher programs. So I want to turn it back over to Bacardi to give us some specific examples of what's going on in the voucher landscape and how vouchers are evolving in Florida. And that's the next slide. Thank you. So in my role as senior supervising attorney, we've had the opportunity to um, collaborate with a number of others in the state as we've been trying to navigate this very difficult landscape of ever increasing privatization in Florida. So in some ways, Florida provides a microcosm of the voucher debates that are going on all across the country. Um, Florida has been at the forefront of the fight over private school vouchers since the 1999 through 2007 governorship of Jeb Bush, one of his signature policies was the Opportunity Scholarship Program, or OSP. It was a private school voucher program that was paid for directly out of the state education funds. 
the OST included a number of restrictions on the ways in which you could use those vouchers, including requirements that the participating schools could not discriminate on the basis of race, religion, or national origin. They had to agree not to compel any student who was attending those private schools um, on an opportunity scholarship to profess a specific ideological belief, to pray or to worship, and they had to agree to accept the voucher as full tuition. In 2000, a coalition of public school advocates successfully challenged the OST. And the Florida Supreme Court struck down the OSP in 2006. In its ruling, the court focused on the constitutional mandate to create a uniform system of public schools. Um, it was a requirement that the court interpreted to mean that the legislature could not create an unlimited private school voucher program because doing so would fail to be uniform, it would fail to be public, and it would fail to be a public system. The court focused on the constitutional mandate to create the uniform system of public schools. And I'm sorry, after that decision, the legislature moved to create more voucher programs that were still within the narrow window that the court left open. And it passed two new vouchers, the McKay and Gardner vouchers for students with disabilities. The legislature also realized that vouchers that didn't involve direct government spending might pass muster under that case. So it created two tax credit voucher programs, the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship for low-income students and the HOPE Scholarship that Jessica mentioned earlier for bullied students. So as of the fall of 2018, Florida's voucher program collectively enrolled about 151,000 students at a cost to taxpayers of almost $1 billion annually. So not only did Florida have some of the earliest voucher programs and the first voucher program for students with disabilities, it has continued to enact new permutations of voucher programs just as um, Jessica discussed. In addition to the ones that I just mentioned, Florida also um, was one of the first um, reading voucher programs in the country, which was enacted in 2018, which provides vouchers of up to $500 to public school students with low reading scores to use for things like private tutoring. And now the most recent um, voucher program that was just enacted during this last legislative session is the Family Empowerment Scholarship Voucher. And it uses a traditional voucher funding structure, but with the caveat that the funds don't, don't come from the education funds as the OSP had, but instead they come from the general fund in anticipation of being able to challenge Bush v. Holmes. Now, interestingly, the Family Empowerment Scholarship voucher doesn't include any of the protections that were included in the Opportunity Scholarship program that was struck down. It doesn't include the protection around discrimination or around not compelling students to uh, profess specific ideological beliefs, or even the schools don't have to accept the voucher as full tuition. They can ex um, have their tuition cost be greater than what the voucher is for. So Florida has been a leading testing ground, and several other states have now proposed iterations of, of these various types of voucher funding mechanisms, the tax credits, the education savings accounts, and now the traditional mechanism that's in the FESP voucher. Also, Florida's programs represent an example of how the vouchers are targeted first to different vulnerable student populations, including students with disabilities and students who are bullied, very empathetic groups, which then leads the way to the expansion of these voucher programs to more student populations. Another way that legislators do this, and they, that has, they have done in Florida, is they gradually increase the size of the voucher programs with automatic annual increases that are built into the legislation. Now, what's wrong with all of this? Well, the private school vouchers, as I'm sure most of you know, are a profound threat to the educational equity in Florida. As a, a billion dollars of public money being spent annually on unregulated private schools, while our public schools are profoundly underfunded. We are 41st out of 50 in the nation in funding fairness. Um, so it's an example of significant resources being taken from public schools 
and what can happen in other states if voucher programs go unchecked. The private school vouchers in Florida fund institutions that discriminate on the basis of, of among other things, religion and sexual orientation. Um, in Florida, at least two thirds of the private schools receive, receiving vouchers under our existing programs are religious schools. At least a third of those voucher schools use curricula that advance a wide variety of false and bigoted views, such as the idea that the war between the states was God's punishment for religious apostasy and cultism. Now, many of these schools also have religious tests for admission and students and employee conduct policies that discriminate against LGBTQ people. Private schools are not obligated here to admit students with disabilities or to provide those they do admit with the same rights and services as they would have in public schools. They can also um, expel disabled students without the due process they would get in public schools and can exclude students with the greatest needs through selective admissions. Florida voucher schools can and do charge a tuition above the amount of the voucher and it creates a school system that's stratified by class, which denies poor children an equitable education because too, it affects the funding that's left in the public schools. And consistent with the segregative history of voucher school, of voucher programs, voucher schools here may use policies such as excluding students with discipline histories, which will have the effect of discriminating on the basis of race because of how disciplinary policies are employed. Now, Florida's voucher schools are also almost entirely unregulated. Unlike traditional public schools, voucher recipient private schools can also ignore performance metrics that are required by our public schools. It can ignore state curriculum standards. It can use whatever academic admission standards they like. Um, in addition to these, these lack of regulations, it means that some of these schools are also not structurally sound. Um, they don't have the same standards or annual inspection requirements and there has been media coverage that highlights that private schools have failed fire inspections, they are unsafe during hurricanes, and otherwise have not been able to pass health and safety inspections. As you might expect, Florida has seen a handful of high profile lawsuits about vouchers, which mirror the issues that are being litigated across the country as well. So as I mentioned, the Bush v. Holmes case, which was in 2006, challenged the voucher program on the basis that it violated the state constitution because it diverted public money into the private education system, which contravened the requirement that public system, the public system be the only means of fulfilling the state's education mandate. And it also violated the uniformity requirement that's in our state constitution. In 2016, there was another case, McCall versus Scott. And in that case, the court ruled that the taxpayers lacked standing to challenge the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship Program as violating the state constitutional provisions prohibiting state revenue to aid churches and requiring a system of free and uniform public schools. And review of that case was denied by the Florida Supreme Court. And this is the same result that we, may, we see in many challenges to tax credit voucher programs. Um, we expect that there will be a coming lawsuit. Um, education advocates will be challenging the latest private school voucher program in Florida, the Florida, the Florida Empowerment Scholarship Program um, that I mentioned. And we know that this program was passed to set up a direct challenge to the Bush v. Holmes case. Um, and conservative leaders in Florida believe they can overturn that precedent because they recently gained a 6-1 or 7-0 conservative majority on the Florida Supreme Court. The claims we expect will likely mirror those in Bush v. Holmes that will address the provisions of Florida's Constitution, Constitution's education article and the no aid clause. Um, by directly funding hundreds, if not thousands of private schools that discriminate against students, educators, and families on the basis of their race, national origin, language status, disability status, religion, and or LGBTQ status, Florida is failing to uphold its state constitutional duties. So hopefully a challenge will, will highlight that. But even if the conservative leaders are right about the likely outcome in this current Supreme Court of ours, it would hopefully at least draw public attention to the many ways in which the, the Empowerment Scholarship Program and other programs are failing to serve Florida's children. Notably, 73% of Florida voters 
support holding private schools private schools and voucher programs to the same educational standards as public schools. And public education is in the top three economic priorities for voters of all parties in Florida. So I'll turn it back to Jessica to talk more about the national landscape. Thanks, Bacardi. And just on the next slide um, are some of the effects of vouchers that have been found by academic researchers um and and others who are studying specific programs across the country and bacardi's examples provided us with a vivid picture of some of these findings um to and just to summarize them researchers have have found that vouchers have a, a range of negative effects on students and this often flies in the face as we said of promises that voucher proponents make about the effects of vouchers so Students using vouchers have been found to fare worse academically than students in public schools. And this research continues, um, research on, on this finding continues to pile up. Um, there was a recent study of Louisiana's voucher program that some of you may have read that confirmed uh, that students who were in that program all throughout their high school career fared worse academically. Um, voucher programs also undermine public schools that may already be under-resourced as we've discussed. Research has also shown that voucher programs can increase segregation on several fronts and that they lack accountability and transparency for academic outcomes, for how finances are used and other metrics. As Bacardi also gave us some examples, vouchers also negatively affect students' civil rights. Uh, and this includes discrimination in admissions um, and also lack of protections for students who are who become enrolled in private schools using voucher programs. Um, this can mean fewer rights protections under the law for students with disabilities, as we've discussed, students of color, LGBT students. And this also can intersect with the way that voucher programs erode the separation of church and state. As, as Bacardi's examples showed, many voucher programs permit religious or religiously affiliated schools to participate in the voucher program. This itself erodes the separation between religious organizations and the state that's often prohibited under the federal constitution or under state constitutions. And it can also have discriminatory effects, such as when a religiously affiliated school won't admit students of a certain religion or students, students or families who are LGBT um, or may discriminate against them after they are enrolled. We'd be happy to answer more questions on the specifics of those academic and civil rights impacts. We want to move now just to a few minutes on the last uh, phase of the webinar and um, a little bit more detail for you all on the public funds public schools campaign and that's the next slide. Public funds public schools is a national campaign to ensure that all public funds for education are used to maintain and support public schools and it is a collaboration of education law center, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the SPLC Action Fund, and with partnership and support from the national law firm Munger, Tolls, and Olson. As we've discussed, public schools serve the ma vast majority of our country's students. As Dr. Jackson said, it's around 90% of our country's students. Uh, and they have to be open to all students and comply with all state and federal laws protecting those students' civil rights and educational opportunities. But chronic underfunding in many states means that public schools can't fulfill this role if the funds are being diverted to separate systems of private schools um, throughout the country. So in order to determine the most effective places to engage in litigation and advocacy, Public Funds Public Schools is analyzing voucher programs and their implementation in states across the country, as well as monitoring legislative proposals um, for new or expanded voucher programs in all 50 states and at the federal level. One of the major ways that we're doing this and why we're so glad to be uh, on this webinar today is to collaborate with state and local organizations. And we would welcome hearing from those listening to the webinar about what's happening with vouchers in your state, if you don't have vouchers yet, what you may be hearing about proposals. And if you do have vouchers already in your estate, then the effects that they're having on resources for public schools um, and also the effects that they're having on students' rights. The objective of PFPS um, is in opposing voucher programs and other diversions of public 
funds to private schools is to make sure that all students can attend a well-funded, thriving public school in their community that serves their educational needs and complies with their legal rights. And we want, I wanna mention that PFPS opposes all forms of private school vouchers, so all the different types that we talked about earlier in the webinar, and also other forms of diversion of public funds to private educational uses, such as categorical aid or aid in state budgets to send textbook money or other categorical aid to private schools. And we're also participating in, in litigation on those types of funding diversions that we'd be happy to talk about. The final slide, we can just go to that last one, um, gives a little bit more detail on the range of tools that PFPS is using. Um, we, we discussed some of the tools related to legislative proposals for vouchers, and Bacardi also gave us um, some examples from the litigation realm. And we just wanna touch back on that for a second because litigation is such an important tool that PFPS is using to fight um, new or expanded voucher programs because they raise a number of legal issues. Um, they may violate a state constitution's education clause or other provisions of a state constitution, um, such as uh, the need to provide a uniform system of public schools or prohibitions on using public money for religious institutions or religious schools or they might, may violate civil rights protections for protected groups of students. Um, so PFPS is seeking to engage in this type of litigation, to support this type of litigation with amicus briefs, and to support other organizations who are engaging in litigation on these fronts. Um, and research is one more um, very important front in the voucher fight, um, because the so much of the um, well-researched studies on vouchers shows their negative effects to academic outcomes and other, other metrics for students. Um, and so PFPS is dedicated to also amplifying and making available the results of that research to litigators and to policy advocates um, and to, and to uh, augmenting the effective communications on all of these topics and between those at the state, local, and national level who are fighting vouchers. So the last thing that we'll say is to encourage you to visit our website, pfps.org, which has more information on litigation, on advocacy, on the research front, and you can also sign up uh, for our news blast that way. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Well, Jack. You both gave us a great deal of um, information, and I want us to um, go to some of the questions. And I wanna remind everyone, please type your questions and comment into the uh, chat box. Um, I see that we have uh, a number of questions that we will get to. But you, you, you both talked a, a little about um, how the laws vary state to state and what's happened at the federal level. Can you take a few uh, minutes and talk about what are the conditions that uh, parents and advocates should, should look for um, to sort of have some indication that there is a privatization um, bill or scheme that is moving forward. Bacardi, should I start out with a few a few things and please jump in? Um, yes. This is a great question. Um, and there are, you know, so many factors um, that go into the evolving privatization landscape and create conditions for these proposals. One element that's important to mention, of course, is the climate around vouchers and privatization at the federal level. Um, so Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has been pushing vouchers and privatization as a key part of her agenda. And there have been significant federal voucher, voucher proposals in recent years, like the Education Freedom Scholarships and Opportunity Act, which is, has bills proposed in both the Senate and the House. Um, so What's going on at the federal level and who controls the federal agenda is obviously very important for seeing whether um, we're going to have more and more voucher proposals and what kind of chances they have of passing. Um, and that also kind of creates the or influences the climate at the state level. Um, so the state level is critical. Um, who is elected at the state level, what their views on privatization are, whether we continue to see these coalitions, including maybe unlikely coalitions um, at the state level to block voucher legislation. Um, and there are 
several well-funded and well-resourced pro-voucher groups um, like the Institute for Justice or ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council that, um, that promote voucher legislation. Um, and, and these states work at the, these organizations work at the state level. They work state by state. Um, providing resources to promote the voucher agenda um, and going state by state. And then we often see new forms of vouchers proliferate state to state, like tax credit vouchers um, when we first started seeing those, or more recently, bullying vouchers. Um, as Bacardi explained, Florida was the first state to propose a bullying voucher, as an example, um, and they passed that program. And then in the last one or two legislative sessions, we've seen a whole handful of states propose those that type of bullying voucher. Um, so these things proliferate at the state level with the backing of well-resourced groups. Um, a couple more things, advocacy and action um, among concerned community members is one thing that can really tip the balance one way or the other as to whether voucher legislation will pass in a state. Um, and we talked about some examples like in West Virginia and Arizona where teachers have done a lot of advocacy um, or parents and families have done advocacy. Um, and I'd say finally the courts are um, can be a very important check on voucher programs that may violate state or federal law. So what happens in state and federal courts and who is appointed um, is, is also very important for that landscape. All right. Mariana, you want to take some of the questions from the chat? Hi, everyone. This is Mariana Islam. I'm the Director of Programs and Advocacy at the Schott Foundation. And I have been engaged in, chat, in the chat box, um, hearing all of your questions and comments. And just want to thank you for those of you who are posing questions and those of you who are posing resources to links um, and helping to answer some of the questions or provide some additional information. Uh, so thank you for that. I will um, just add that we will be sharing the recording. And so if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our newsletter at theshotfoundation.org uh, to be alerted when that uh, webinar becomes available. So we have a number of questions that have come in and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, there are questions directed around messaging. Uh, and so I want to start with those. And then we also have questions around parent involvement and engagement uh, that would also be uh, helpful uh, to answer. And then finally, we have questions coming in around resources uh, and, and research because there are several uh, folks who have uh, commented that they're hearing or reading conflicting reports around the benefits of voucher programs. And so I'll start with the uh, messaging questions first. Uh, we have one question about the demographics of uh, Florida is two thirds black and Hispanic. And with those numbers, it becomes difficult for messaging about the programs being an attack on civil rights to be effective. What other messaging options do you think would be viable? That's a great question, and one of the things that is um, not always readily known by parents is what they lose when they go to private schools. And as Jessica talked about, oftentimes um, students lose a lot of the rights, of the federal, federal rights that they would have in public schools, um, so they don't have those same protections. Um, in addition, there is no evidence here in Florida that students are faring better in those private schools. And, and I think that is probably particularly true for students of color. So I think there are other messaging points that we are engaging with researchers about. One of the things that PFPS is doing is, is engaging with researchers to help answer some of these questions. Um, scholars who are, are interested in helping us delve into it because there is so much um, politicized information out there. Um, we are hoping to, to try to to deal with some of that and, and, and dig a little deeper as to the actual results of what's happening in these schools. And, and, and here in Florida, for instance, it's really, really hard for anyone to make a claim that students are doing better in one school, kinds of school over another, because they just don't have the same standards. Um, they're not taking the same test um, unless a parent requests that. But overall, you can't even compare the two kinds of systems that are existing. 
Great. Uh, uh, Jessica, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, that was a great answer. I would I would just add that um, I think Bacardi is absolutely right. There are a lot of hidden um, rights losses or losses of rights that families don't necessarily know about or aren't advertised when voucher programs are advertised. And just to take the example of English language learner students, of which there are many in Florida, um, that's a significant segment of the Florida student population, and students don't have the same rights to um, English language acquisition programs or bilingual programs, ESL programs are the same um, opportunity to access those programs in private schools um, if they take a voucher as they do have the protections in public schools. Um, so that's you know, a, an example that is particularly impacting families in Florida if they take a voucher. So I wanna ask a very uh, straightforward question that someone posted. If uh, the student is not in a public school, why should the public school receive the dollars? Well, well, I think one answer is that the public schools have fixed costs. So if students leave and go over to private schools, it doesn't reduce the fixed cost of buildings and salaries um, that the public schools have. And instead what it does is it ends up leaving the public schools to have to cut other really important resources for students who are left in those schools because they still have those fixed costs. And, and Jessica, you may want to add to that. No, absolutely. I think that's one, uh, that's another kind of hidden um, effect of voucher programs or one that doesn't get talked about so much because it's a great question. If the, if the pupil isn't in the school, then why should the school receive the per pupil funding? And um, I agree completely with what Bacardi said about fixed costs like for capital maintenance or educator salaries that if a few students leave a school or even many students from different grade levels, different classrooms, the school can't necessarily um, reduce or reduce proportionately the fixed cost that it has for those students. Um, and I would also just mention, this is again, something that is um, vividly illustrated in Florida, that the private, that, that there's a lot of fraud and waste often um, because of, as Bacardi mentioned, a lack of transparency, a lack of oversight. Um, and so public dollars are often just being wasted um, in those situations. Uh, and so, so it's more complicated than it might seem at first glance. Got it. Great. We have a question. Um, there was uh, a comment about uh, parent presence in this conversation. Uh, and as a parent myself, um, could you answer why might some parents, uh, particularly students of color, uh, of uh, students with disabilities, support vouchers when it's not necessarily in their best interest to? Uh, and trying to give this uh, person a better understanding around the narrative around between public schools versus private. I'll start off by saying that um, I think, again, it, it, part of it goes back to a lack of full information about what will be offered to a student in a voucher program. So. Um, it may be advertised as a way for a student to get you know, a better education in some way. Um, as we've talked about, there are civil rights protections that are lost um, that can lead to the student you know, losing a lot of the educational benefit or even, for example, being disciplined and kicked out of the private school without recourse to protections, um, for example, for students with disabilities that would exist in the public school. Um, and another important piece of information about taking a private school voucher is that it often doesn't cover the full cost of a student's tuition or all the educational services that that student might need. Um, so for example, for a student with disabilities, but this, this can be true of um, many different groups of students, but for a student with disabilities, like in Florida's special education voucher programs, um, they would get a voucher for a certain amount of money, but in the Gardner or the McKay scholarship voucher program, but that voucher often would not cover the full tuition um, that that student needs to attend a private school. Or even if it did, 
um, that private school may not be including in the tuition, many of the services, the therapies, aids that a student with disabilities might need. Um, so a parent who chooses a voucher program um, may be told that they will receive a better education for their child with disabilities or for their child with other particular needs that they don't feel are being met. Uh, but when they actually go to the private school, they are left um, with the responsibility of making up a lot of the um, cost of that student's education and without recourse to the protections under civil rights laws. And Bacardi, you may and want I to can, add from your experience in Florida. And, and I will add from my experience here in Florida also as a parent of three children. Um, and my experience has been that when I had my children in a private school initially and moved them to a public school, I was surprised to learn of all of the benefits that they did not have in their prior school. I had no idea about that, um, partly beca because again, as Jessica talked about, the information just isn't there. If you're not engaged in a public school, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're entitled to that you don't have. Um, I, when I, we got to a gifted program, I, I saw how much further behind my children were from the private school, which had promised and had, had talked about um, pushing children ahead one or two grades, and it just simply was not the case. And again, because the private schools take different tests, they have different academic standards, there really is no real way to compare them. And sometimes these fraudulent claims can't be called out because of that. And so you can't say that they were actually being fraudulent because they're not comparing apples to apples. They're not taking the same test. So an A grade in a private school is really meaningless when you're comparing it to a public school and you don't have any idea about those various differences. So that's, that's a big part of what I think has to happen with the research and with the education and what's incumbent on us is to make sure that we do demand some accountability and we do demand a way to have parents be educated about what they actually are getting and not just being subject to the marketeering of these profiteers. Great. So there are a number of questions and comments um, about the data and trying to find data on uh, the outcomes for students in private schools or voucher programs. I just want to point to the uh, Southern Education Foundation. Um, from time to time, they will uh, produce uh, school privatization briefs. There's a link at the 341 mark in the uh, chat box that I will refer everyone to. Another question that was asked um, is specifically related to the uh, campaign and whether public funds, public schools um, supports ab abolishing private schools and where do charters fit in this discussion? Um, thank you, that's a great question. Um, parents have the right under the law to send their, their children to private school. Um, and we acknowledge that and, that and that's up to parents. Public funds, public schools opposes the use of public funds for private education. Um, so we oppose the different mechanisms by which money is funneled away from the already under-resourced public education system in many places to private schools or other private educational uses. Charters are not part of public funds, public schools work. Um, so our focus with this campaign is specifically on the different types of voucher programs and the other ways that um, money from the public, but treasury might flow to private schools. Um, charters are public schools, um, though they're, they're subject to different legal requirements often. So that is not part of um, PFPS's work. That's a good question. And if I could just add something on, on the last question um, that I want to make sure to say, which is um, that, that everything we've talked about today is not to discount struggles that parents may have in public schools. Um, our goal is to recognize that public schools need adequate resources in order to be able to meet the needs of every child, of that 90% of American students who are being educated in public schools. They need enough resources to meet the needs of students with disabilities, with English language needs, um, and to make sure that there is compliance with 
all the range of civil rights protections that, that protect those child's right to be in school, to stay in school, and to receive an adequate education under their state constitutions as well, which guarantee education in, across the country. Um, and so our goal is to make sure that critically needed resources to keep public schools strong, to improve public schools where they need to be improved, stay in those public schools. Mariana, do you have another question from the chat box? So uh, we have a whole lot of questions. And so my thought is um, we take on the questions around where folks can find resources, uh, including any uh, family statements or you know personal statements from parents uh, around their experience or their understanding of this issue that might be helpful. Uh, and, and so if you can direct us to where that can be found, that would be really helpful. And then um, for the questions that we weren't able to get to today, maybe we can chat about it um, and do sort of a Q&A blog, uh, because these are really good questions that really challenge us, I think, to think about, um, you know, questions that might come up, uh, you know, during, um, uh, uh, you know, the course of your work. Sure, we'd, we'd be happy to continue that. Go ahead, Bacardi. No, I was just saying that's a great idea. Yes, great idea. And, and just as for resources, um, so one, one place to start is the Public Funds Public Schools website, pfps.org, uh, and that will offer parents, advocates, attorneys, there are resources there for everyone, um, depending on what you're looking for. There is more information just on the basics of the different voucher mechanisms. Um, and the different types of voucher programs. Soon there will be that legislative tracking tool on the front page that we mentioned where you can look and see what's been proposed in your state for um, possible additional voucher programs. Um, there are resources about um, advocacy efforts and examples of when both professional advocates, grassroots advocates, parents um, have gotten involved in this fight um, and been successful um, in defeating voucher proposals. There are uh, resources about research. So we have tried to um, consolidate and summarize research showing many of the different effects of vouchers from segregative effects to negative effects on academic outcomes and other things. So if you wanna read more about what the research shows about vouchers, you can do that on our website. And finally, you can read about court challenges as well. Um, you can read uh, summaries of different court challenges in different states to voucher programs. Um, and also what public funds public schools is doing to challenge vouchers in court. Um, in terms of examples of what parents, what, one thing you said, Mariana, that had been asked was, you know, examples of what parents are doing. Um, and one, one organization that um, parents could check out if they're interested in this is Save Our Schools Arizona, um, which I mentioned earlier, it's been very successful in that state in um, helping to roll back expansions of Arizona's voucher program through getting signatures to put a referendum on the ballot and then campaigning and getting that voucher program, that expansion um, halted. So that's one example of how community members can get involved, whether you're a professional advocate or an attorney or somebody who wants to volunteer for these types of efforts. There are many, many ways to get involved. And we would encourage you to sign up for our news blasts on our website. And also please contact us directly if you're looking for what's going on in your state or ways that you can get involved. Great. Any last words, Ricardi? I would just say to build on one of the points that I think Jessica made that's really important and has come up in a lot of the questions is that we absolutely support that parents have to make decisions on a different level, that where you have organizations coming in to look at systemic problems and look for systemic solutions, we're looking at it from a different lens, but absolutely respect the rights of parents who have to make those individual choices. And, and that's none of the work that we're doing is suggesting otherwise, but we are tasked with, and, and what our groups are focused on, are these institutional systemic problems and how do we get the best results for all students and make sure all students can attend thriving public schools. Well, I wanna thank you, Bacardi, and you also, Jessica, for uh, your presentations today. I also wanna thank you for the work that you put in in starting the Public Funds Public Schools uh, campaign and the collaboration.
Um, we know that having a strong public education system uh, benefits our democracy, um, benefits opportunity across the board. And I think it's important and clear to note that education is a public good. So it's with that effort that we will continue at the Child Foundation to support the, the parents and the students who daily are fighting for a high quality public education across the country. So I wanna thank you for the conversation today. Thank you for your questions. And the only thing I'll say is let's keep learning, let's keep fighting, and let's keep loving one another. Thank you, have a great afternoon. Thank you for inviting thank you. us.